G'day and welcome to another episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name's Chris Muir and I'm a product manager who works for Oracle Corporation. Now in today's episode, we're continuing off from the previous episode in looking at ADF architectural patterns. In the previous episode, we looked at the small and simple architectural pattern because like it name says, basically it's good for building small applications. It's very simple to actually architect and build. There's nothing too complex about it. Now in this specific episode, we're gonna be looking at the colossal pattern. And as the name suggests, well, it's a little larger than the small and simple architectural pattern. So what are some of the characteristics of the colossal pattern? Well, first of all, the name colossal is really synonymous in our case with the terms Uber, which is a German word for large, or monolithic or monster. But we don't really mean here monster in terms of something that scares my kids. And believe me, I've got two girls and a lot of things scares my kids. Um, what we really mean here is something that's got very large. And by that, this particular pattern, the colossal pattern, is therefore an extreme of the small and simple application architectural pattern that we saw in the previous episode. Now, from the perspective of an ADF or JDeveloper application, the characteristics of the colossal pattern is, well, you still have a model and a view controller project, and your model potentially has your typical EOs, VOs, AMs, but then in the view controller project, not only do we have an unbounded task flow with a number of pages, but for the first time we're injecting bounded task flows into your actual application. And you may have one to many of these. So considerably the application can get very large, colossal, because you're bringing in bounded task flows, which themselves aren't a bad things, but you're really extending the application and putting quite a lot of functionality into those bounded task flows to make the overall application based on this pattern very large. Similar to the last episode, let's now look at this particular architectural pattern, the colossal pattern, in a diagrammatic format, which will assist you in learning and expressing and understanding, I guess, what this particular pattern looks like. So similar to previous, we have a application workspace, just one application workspace made up of a model project with all your entity objects, your view objects, your application modules, and the framework extension classes. Now, in the view controller project though, we are going to see a difference. In the view controller project, yes, we will have our unbounded task flow because typically your application requires one of these, in particular for your first landing page. And yes, similar to previous, we will have our reusable parts such as page templates, declarative components, skins, and view controller extensions. Oh, and as you can put, see there as well, task flow templates because we're about to introduce bounded task flows for the first time, task flow templates will be useful. And so talking about bounded task flows, then your application will be made up of one to many bounded task flows, potentially based on pages, but more likely based on page fragments, because these are more reusable in the sense that they can be embedded in a page, why a page can't be embedded in another page. How many bounded task flows you have, really up to your requirements and your design. But from an architectural pattern perspective, the colossal architecture pattern as different from the small and simple architectural pattern, well, basically it introduces bounded task flows and a lot more functionality, really expanding out that workspace until it's colossal in size. The one little last thing that we need to mention though is from the colossal architectural pattern, the same as the small and simple pattern, is ultimately we generate one EAR file or one deployment artifact, and this is what's deployed to our application servers, so WebLogic server, typically for most Oracle customers. Okay, so we've got an idea of what the characteristics of the colossal pattern are, but in terms of building an application based on this pattern, well, what design considerations do you have? What questions will you be needing to ask yourself and answer from the design perspective of your actual application build? Well, one of the first things that you need to ask yourself is, well, with the introduction of bounded task flows or BTFs, is what is the granularity of your BTFs? Your application may be made up of maybe a couple of bounded task flows and then the grand reality will be quite uh, coarse, I guess. But if your application is made up of many, many bounded task flows, then there is this sort of perennial question of how coarse should each bounded task flow be or how granular? Should it just be one or two or three activities or should it be 10, 20 or 30 activities? Now, the problem is, is, well, with both answers, there's advantages and disadvantages. 
if you take quite coarse bounded task flows with lots of functionality and lots of activities built in if at some stage you want to just snip out a part of the bounded task flow and reuse it from another bounded task flow it's not so easy because you've made one big fat bounded task flow the flip side is you might then decide, oh, what we should do then is have lots of little fine grain bounded task flows and just wrap that in a coarse grain bounded task flow that calls down to all those fine grain ones. Now that's sort of good from the beginning point of view. You think from a reuse point of view, that's a really good idea. But then the problem is, is you've got to maintain all those little bounded task flows and some of them may never be reused. So you built them for a use, but then they're not actually going to be reused at all. Maybe only one out of 10. So this is one of the questions or one of the ultimate questions about bounded task flows. What should be the granularity of your bounded task flows? Now you may think this has a similar issue. Uh, this, sorry, let me say that again. This was a, is an issue that's only particular to ADF development because we have bounded task flows. But if you look at the SOA or the service oriented architecture world and the world of web services, this same services based approach. So think of a bounded task flow as a bunch of services. This same service based approach. This is a question that the SOA world is quite hung up on as well. So we can't answer that necessarily for you. What granularity BTFs should you have? But it is a consideration that you need to take into account when designing an ADF application. From the perspective of bringing in bounded task flows as well, you also may open up some other interesting questions like, well, what is a candidate for bounded task flows and what is a candidate for, well, declarative components as an example. Now, you know a declarative component is designed to show a specific layout on the screen of a number of components with values injected in. And in some ways, it's kind of like a bounded task flow with exactly one view activity. So questionally, should you build bounded task flows with one view activity for um, providing a, the, you know, so displaying something on the screen or map to a bunch of say ADF business components behind the scenes? Or rather, should you build a declarative component which you again can do standard layout, but you actually have to inject the values into? Well, not sure. Um, maybe declarative components would be better for layouts, but declarative components aren't very good for actual business functionality when you need to bring that in. So there is kind of a line drawn there, but it's really up to you. Interesting fact is um, up to very recently, Oracle's Fusion Applications, it's kind of the penultimate ADF application that's ever been written. Well, it didn't actually use declarative components at all. It used bounded out task flows with one activity. Now that might suddenly make you go, oh, why? why did Oracle do that? But you've got to remember declarative components is a relatively new feature in the ADF framework. It wasn't introduced in the early days of JDeveloper 11G. So from Fusion Applications perspective, they didn't really have a chance to use it until more recently. Let's then consider some of the advantages of the colossal pattern on applications based on this pattern. One of the first uh, advantages is that that was actually experienced via the small and simple pattern. The fact that an application built on the colossal pattern is really still a relatively simple architectural application. Now I know this because I'm actually in the following episode is going to talk about some of the more sophisticated patterns. Definitely sophisticated but also more complex patterns where the architecture becomes, well, harder to deal with. But in the case of the small and simple architectural pattern and the colossal pattern, the well architecture is very simple. There's one workspace and building and deploying is really just a couple of clicks in the IDE. Putting that aside, another advantage of the colossal pattern is really realized through the introductions of bounded task flows. Now, if you haven't worked it out yet, bounded task flows are extremely important to the ADF framework. They are an incredibly great enabling technology for allowing you to build quite sophisticated applications because they allowed you to break your application up into lots of little bits rather than just pages, which traditional UI or web designers are stuck at. Now, I've often quipped or joked that, it, that one day when ADF is no longer the framework that Oracle uses, and oh, God forbid that day comes along because I'll be out of a job. But I've often said that if I, I hope the one feature that ADF gives to the rest of the world that other frameworks and other solutions take on is that of the bounded task flow. It's such an important and powerful concept that hopefully other frameworks will pick it up.
Indeed, if you look at the latest Java server faces specification, JSF 2.2, they now include the equivalent of the concept of bounded task flows. So you can see the idea is really getting out there. So from a technical perspective, bounded task flows are really quite important, but you may not realize they're also very, very important from the concept of communicating to the business your intention of the application that you're building. If you think about it, a bounded task flow is a bunch of flows and method calls and processes. Ah, processes flows. That sounds like the language of the business analyst. Now traditionally, UI or web page designers, when talking to the rest of the business, could only really talk about HTML and CSS. But with a ADF programmer, and that's you, you now are able to just about speak in the same language as the business, as the business analyst, because you can now explain this concept of about a task flow, talk about, well definitely that it's made up of view activities, but also routers and method calls and a flow. And this is a great ability or a metaphor or a mechanism essentially to communicate the intentions of the application. Your BAs can talk in the concept of bounded task flows and you can talk back to them in terms of the process of flows. So this is a very fantastic feature. Another technical benefit of bounded task flows is the concept of modularization. Because rather than developing a number of web pages, is really, well, that's kind of a concept that we had in the previous pattern, but with banner task flows, we now have the ability to break our, pay, our, our application up into a number of banner task flows, regions and pages, basically a whole bunch of boundaries. We're interjecting a new architectural or building piece into our application. And these banner task flows are very much like, from a programming perspective, a function with inputs and outputs and relating code. And if your programmers work with these correctly, they really should be able to write these in such a way that they are modularized and not tightly coupled on other parts of your application. Now, I agree that in context of ADF applications all written in one workspace, it's very easy for developers still to tightly couple code, share code that they shouldn't. But the bounded task flow is introducing a building concept or a construct that we didn't have before. So it allows us hopefully to move to a more modularized type solution. In addition, because our application is now made up of bounded task flows, we've got the concept of programming by contract coming into play. From a design or an architectural point of view, you can now specify all your bounded task flows in a design document and basically talk about their inputs and their outputs very much like a 3GL function. So this concept of, well, contract, programming by contract, is a powerful one that's been in other 3GL languages, and we now see it introduced into web page development. So that's a very exciting ability that ADF and BTFs that bring into our um, application development. Finally, because again, we're introducing these bounded task flows, another advantage that we get is where we start to get the ability to focus testing on different parts of our application, rather than just having to test the whole thing because it's potentially tightly coupled. Now again, we may still have modularization or tight coupling issues because when the programmers are programming all in the same workspace, there's nothing to really stop our bounded task flow programmers using each other's code. But again, we've got a construct that is now introducing better modularization. And if we do have better modularization, that means we can test individual parts of our application as well as undergoing our typical regression tests. So the bounded task flow as a construction or an ADF framework reusable feature really interjects a whole bunch of design and architectural advantages that we didn't have in the small and simple architectural pattern. In fact, the small and simple architectural pattern, that was how we built applications in JDeveloper 10G. And you look at it today, most Oracle applications are built in JDeveloper 11G basically because of that fantastic bounded task flow feature set that we actually get available to us. Now, the disadvantages of the colossal pattern, well, we've already kind of talked about some of them. Because, well, we've introduced better task flows, we do definitely get better modularization occurring in our application workspace, but it's not perfect because coders can still accidentally tightly couple code. There's nothing we can really do to stop them from using code from one banner task flow and another banner task flow. That wasn't our original intention. In addition, the colossal application workspace, as you add more and more and more and more bounded task flows, the application workspace gets, well, 
colossal, huge, uber, monolithic, and you're building and your deployment, oh, this can become quite a exercise. And I do remember back in the JDeveloper 10G days when developers uh, had created very large applications without the ability to break them up into multiple workspaces. Hmm, we'll be talking about that in the following episode soon. But those developers, they used to complain about how hard it was to build and deploy their applications. In addition, because we have potentially poor modularization occurring, we can't really do unit testing completely on our banded task flows because we can't guarantee that the banded task flows aren't using separate pieces of code from other banded task flows and parts of the application that they shouldn't. So this in turn means that every time we make a little change in this application architecture and we deploy our application, we really should go through a full regression test just to ensure that we haven't injected some problem into another part of the application where it's accidentally sharing some code or whatever we just changed. In addition with bounded task flows, and it's really kind of the last point on this slide, we get a whole bunch of new options become available to us with bounded task flows and not just the architectural piece or the building block as such. And while this slide talks about the transaction options, there's all sorts of other features that come into play that suddenly make, well, uh, building applications a little bit more complex because you've got to understand those options as well, particularly if you want to make use of them. So you could consider this to be a disadvantage of the colossal pattern, although this could also be considered some of the disadvantages of banner task flows. But hey, you know, when you adopt anything, it's always going to have some advantages and disadvantages. So that's the yin and yang of, well, application development for, uh, programming in our, in our, in our, from our perspective. So that concludes our look at the colossal pattern, the architectural pattern, which is really a major extension of the small and simple architectural pattern by just the fact that we've rammed a number of different bounded task flows into it to make it really large. Now in that particular pattern description, the colossal pattern, we talked about breaking applications up into separate workspaces. And in the next episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel, excuse me, getting tongue twisted, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the sum of the parts pattern where we're going to break our application up into multiple workspaces. And once we hit this particular pattern, once you understand the benefits and what we're actually doing, then a whole bunch of new patterns open up in front of you because you'll understand that there's all different sorts of ways we can orchestrate our applications. So thanks again for joining us on this ADF Architecture TV episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and I also hope we'll see you in the next episode where we'll talk about the sum of the parts pattern.